Of course, hiding data doesn't compare to publishing false data. And this is to say nothing about intent. I don't want to get in trouble. That it, not to say whether false data is deliberately published or not, but you know, the fact that it is published misleads people. The outcome is the same. And it's certainly striking that there seems to be a reluctance by some investigators in correcting the record when these inaccuracies are identified. This here is one example where it seems incorrect data has been published. This study involved a new, first-in-class cholesterol-lowering drug called evolocumab, and it concluded benefit with respect to cardiovascular outcomes. The data on which this conclusion was based, however, appears to be a little problematic. The clinical study report for evolocumab was compiled by the drug manufacturer and submitted as a part of the process of approval. And this was over 25,000 pages long. So a group of independent investigators managed to access this data through the Protecting Canadians from Unsafe Drugs Act of 2014. But this was only after being told that it could take up to seven years to get the same data via the US FDA under the Freedom of Information Act. And when they finally did get their hands on this data, it became apparent as to why the drug company might have preferred to keep it under wraps. The first striking finding relates to the ability of this study to identify adverse events. You see, after recruitment had begun, the trial protocol was amended to exclude heart attacks, strokes, and even death from being classified as serious adverse events. <laughs> Again, you literally couldn't make this up. <laughs> now, I, I genuinely wonder if statin trials have used similar strategies in concluding the safety of statins. Not that we're ever likely to know, given how tightly the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration is holding onto their secret data. The major problem with the Fourier study, however, is that the independent investigators found discrepancies in how data had been coded. Specifically, data on the cause of death in study subjects. You see, on-site study investigators recorded the cause of death in any of their patients who were involved in this subject. And this assessment was obviously made with full visibility of the patient's history and medical information. Subsequently, an off-site events committee made their own assessment on the cause of death. And when the in independent investigators rigorously evaluated the cause of death as adjudicated by this clinical events committee, the data that was actually used to draw the study's conclusions, they found that there was a discrepancy in 26% of cases. That is, the local investigators didn't agree with this off-site committee 26% of the time. And 26% is a large enough number to potentially skew the findings of this study. In fact, these independent investigators actually determined that the number of deaths in the Evolucumad group was 133, which was higher than the 88 in the placebo group. They also suggest that had this study not been terminated early, as it was, this probably would have reached statistical significance. Which begs the question, how could such a well-resourced study staffed by numerous experts make so many errors? How could they misclassify 26% of deaths? I hope the fact that Evolucumab launched with an annual cost of 14,000 US dollars doesn't have anything to do with it. At the end of the day, while those with financial interests in the outcome of research continue to hold influence over its design, conduct, and dissemination, there will remain an ever-present risk of bias. As health professionals, we have an obligation to our patients to not only be aware of these issues, but to do our utmost to discern the truth.